In addition to simple random sampling, another random sampling technique is stratified random sampling. In stratified random sampling, we divide our population into subgroups, which are called strata. Each element in the population could belong to one and only one stratum. You must belong to one, only one, and you cannot belong to multiple strata for this to work. Strata are based upon attributes or characteristics in the population. For instance, location or age, department in a college, some demographic or racial characteristic, or perhaps income level. And then you would randomly sample from each stratum, knowing how many people you needed to complete your sample. If you had recruited enough people for a given category that that category had filled up, you would not take any new participants in that category. You would, however, continue to sample to fill up the remaining categories. For instance, at our university, we have proportions for class standing. Let's say that it's 40% freshmen, 25% sophomores, 20% juniors, and 15% seniors. This would be a proportionate stratified random sample. We would draw our sample to make sure that our sample represented exactly the same proportions as we know exist within our population. Alternatively, we could use disproportionate stratified random sampling, in which we predetermine that we want 25% of our sample to be from each of our four groups, sophomores, juniors, freshmen, and seniors. The advantage to stratified random sampling is its economics. You can use smaller samples than you would if you used a simple random sample. And it is also perceived as fair because it is deliberately capturing key characteristics, which makes that sample appear much more representative. However, the use of stratified sampling is limited in that you must be able to frame the entire population and you must be able to classify your population into non-overlapping strata. Another random sampling technique that we could employ is called systematic random sampling. In systematic random sampling, the elements are selected based on a random starting point with a fixed periodic interval for selection. What we might do is begin by making a list of every name of each person in class, or perhaps a list of everyone at the university. We'd randomize that list for starters, and then we determine that we want to sample 10% of our population. We randomly select a number between 1 and 10, and that, among the first 10 individuals, would be our starting point. We would then select every 10th name after that. When we were done, we would have 10% of our total population as part of our systematic sample. Or imagine that we are part of the senior prom planning committee. We want to do a survey, but we don't have time to ask all 400 seniors, so we get a sample of 40. We randomize the names, select one senior at random from among the first 10, and then sample every 10th senior following. Now the advantage of systematic sampling is that it is easy, it's simple, it's convenient, and it reduces bias of incomplete randomization that we would get with simple random sampling techniques. Systematic sampling is a valid way of getting a random sample when the systematic sampling is done correctly. However, systematic sampling is susceptible to manipulation if someone wanted a specific outcome, they might be able to manipulate the data sufficiently to get the desired outcome in the sample. Another technique we could use for random sampling is called the cluster sampling technique. It's going to sound similar to the stratified random sample, but I think you will notice that there is one very distinct difference. In cluster sampling, we divide our population into subgroups, which are called clusters. 
Each cluster is a small scale heterogeneous version of the population. Heterogeneous meaning that although the variability within the sample means that not every element is the same, that they are different from each other in the same way that the population differs. For instance, if we are examining a neighborhood, each city block, although there is variability within that block, is a smaller scale version of the neighborhood. Here's an example of how I might do cluster sampling. I go to a neighborhood near the university. I want to sample this neighborhood, but I don't want to walk through the entire neighborhood. I want to be more efficient in my sampling. So first, I divide my population, my neighborhood, into groups or clusters. And for this example, I would use blocks within the neighborhood. I'm going to assume that the variability on each block is the same. Although this neighborhood might be different than other neighborhoods in the city, the blocks within this neighborhood are different from each other in the same way. I would then randomly select which clusters to sample. I randomly select clusters 2, 7, 13, 16, 21, and 25. The primary advantage of doing my random sampling this way is the ease in which I can do the sampling. It is economical. It reduces the number of interviews. Instead of having to travel to random places throughout the neighborhood, I can go to every house on a specific block and get my information from the participants much more easily. However, this type of cluster sampling is more complex. It is a sophisticated technique that also requires complex data analysis. If you are going to be doing cluster sampling, first talk to your statistician. You need to be working with someone who knows how to do cluster analysis. If you do not have the ability to do cluster analysis, don't do cluster sampling. Another potential disadvantage to cluster sampling is sampling error. The clusters tend to be more similar within than they are between which may limit the generalizability of your findings. Still, cluster sampling, done correctly, can be an excellent way of getting a random sample that can tell you a lot about a very specific population.